Next, we have uh, Sarah Collins, who is CEO and founder of Wonderbag and has created an entrepreneurial solution to many of the world's humanitarian and environmental problems by changing the way people cook. Sarah, love to hear Thank about you. Wonderbag. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Tim, for hosting. Thank you, Peter, for this amazing conference. And thank you to my panelists, everybody who's in this session. Um, it's great to be here. Great to be back in Wall Street, actually, after the pandemic, even though it's, it's digital. I mean, whatever. But so, Wonder Bag, um, my topic, actually, I'm going to start with that, is how carbon finance or carbon credits um, can help drive innovations in the humanitarian space. And um, I have always, I've been a poverty activist all my life. So I've been in social development. And one of the critical biggest challenges that we face in this world, other than what everybody on, on this session has already touched on, and I've written down so many notes, but um, 2.5 billion people still eat off open fires. Indoor air pollution is the biggest killer in the world. Seven million people die annually and five million of those are children from respiratory and from breathing in, um, from breathing in uh, the, the fire. Um, and each home that cooks on firewood uses up to seven trees a year. So I, coming from an economic um, activist and social, social entrepreneur perspective for the past 30 years, I was looking at how do we solve this problem in the developing world, but not as an aid project. Aid, aid has, ha, has not solved the developing world's problem. We have to, in the developing world, come up with our own innovations that are culturally relevant and behavioral so that the behavioral gap is not too big to change. And after trying every single thing in terms of looking at how do we economically stimulate people and women particularly across the African continent, when they're spending five to seven hours a day collecting firewood, um, cooking off open fires, girls not going to school. How do we actually change the economic status of those people? And so I was looking for, for years for solutions. And in 2008, I heard about carbon credits. I had absolutely no idea what they were. And all of you speak with such incredible knowledge and all these smart words. And I'm just a girl from Africa piecing together a project. And so I came across carbon credits and I developed this bag that cooks. So I remembered my grandmother who used to cook with a pot inside a box with cushions. And I thought, well, that's a technology, an ancient technology. Why can't we bring it into the 21st century? And Scott, as you said, every single thing has been solved in the lab. And I have managed to scale First of all, I registered as the first carbon project household by household with any technology like this. It's the only one in the world. And I issued my first carbon credits on the VCF market in 2012 to Microsoft. And um, we have been issuing carbon since 2012, which is 10 years. Um, and we have projects registered on the voluntary carbon market registered in Rwanda for least developed countries and in South Africa. I have two projects. Now, who do we partner with and what are carbon credits and how do they make a difference to innovation in the humanitarian world? For me, I believe in choice and dignity. And I do not believe that people use things that are just given to them and people are patted on the head. That patriarchal way of doing business is gone. And I know many of you might not agree or like to hear that, but that's the truth. And so we have to look at a, a way to empower women in the developing world by purchasing an innovation that's going to change their lives, change their daughter's life at a price that they can afford. So that ranges from um, 
10 US cents to $5. But how do I get bags into 100 million homes at that price? So I started to explore the carbon model and carbon credits were actually thought about in the 60s. And the, the economists and the scientists and the climate change activists then said, surely we should be working with big corporations, the largest emitters in the world, and subsidizing the people most affected by climate change. Because the balance doesn't equal. And so that's how carbon credits were first thought about. They came back in 2005. I learned and spent three years in a hectic um, learning curve of registering carbon credits on the CDM and the voluntary carbon offset market. And then as I got my first, um, the first credits issued, the carbon markets collapsed. So many people are asking, are they gonna collapse again? We've seen a huge spike of demand um, in this space. And Wonder Bag is very particular about who we partner with. And the reason is that we do not believe in whitewashing. I will not work with companies that are just buying our credits to say they're doing something. We need to see intra, intra offsetting first and then offsetting for the last bit to, be, to reach their climate um, their climate uh, goals of climate neutral and zero and as we go on. So, um, and the reason that we choose to work with companies with integrity that have the right, the right are committed to this long term is because Wonderbag is committed to equalizing the status quo. We have to date, um, so all our bags are manufactured by, um, are 96% recycled. You may ask where we get the insulation from. And it's shipped out of Europe. It's all the waste products in the manufacturing, in automobiles, in everything. That gets shipped to Africa and is dumped somewhere. And I don't want to bring that up. But we rescue it and we put it into our factories across the continent and we repurpose it into Wonder Bags. We have two and a half million Wonder Bags being used at the moment. We're issuing, um, anyway, I want to get to Elizabeth's story about food. If we don't impact the food, if we don't change the way people cook, and what is happening in Africa is, and all over the world, is deforestation has taken away the fuel source of people. So they are having been forced to turn from their long cooking food into starting to eat food that is not good for them, is not culturally relevant, and they're only eating three times a week because they cannot get enough firewood or charcoal and they cannot afford it. And this is a reality, guys. I mean, this is, this is what is happening. Now, the Wonder Bag saves 80% of the fuel used. I even put an alarm clock on because I talked for hours. And um, it reduces the amount of fuel. So basically, if you have a huge pile of, of wood, and you bring your food to the boil on your fire for a certain amount of time with a lid on it, you then take it off the fire, you put it into the wonder bag, and it continues to cook for up to 12 hours. It's called the magic bag. I cannot go into communities. Our consumers are desperate to have wonder bags in their homes. How do we get wonder bags into their homes? We get pre-financing on carbon deals and we are able to manufacture the bags. We're able to activate them. Our business is heavily based on data. We have more data in Africa than probably most large FMCGs because we've looked over the last 14 years at the behavior, at where people, what they, what they cook with, how they, um, their behaviors, et cetera, et cetera. So we collect the data of the user habit, every user habits. So every wonder bag has a unique code and that code is registered to a household. And then we have rotational um, community 
uh, monitors that spend time in those homes, around those homes, and understand if the bag's been used and how much it's been used, et cetera, et cetera. Once the year has come up, we then harvest the carbon credits. How do we do that? We have an external company that comes in, assesses our, um, the usage of the bags across all the bags in all the communities. And then we have to go through a heavily audited um, five months um, before we can issue carbon credits on the VERA standard or the CDM, but VERA is our preferred standard and because the voluntary market's growing at such a huge rate. And then we can issue the carbon credits to the companies and banks and whoever has pre-financed them to offset their carbon emissions. So it's a circular business model. It's working. It's the first of its kind in the world. And, you know, everybody's always said to me, but Sarah, you're a humanitarian. You, you sort of a, you're not interested in money. How can you drive a business? I tell you, a woman with a passion who's changing the status quo becomes an ardent capitalist like you've never seen. And we are going to get Wonder Bag across the world to support the food chains. You anyway, know, I must stop now, I think, and have questions. Um, so... <laughs> So that, and it's late here. That's why I'm a bit muddled, I think, if I can be excused. But that's the introduction to Wonderbag. You can certainly learn more about us um, on our website. You can connect with me on, um, on LinkedIn. We've done some really exciting carbon pre-financing deals in the last three months in London and, and in the US. Um, companies that I'm so excited when, they, when we can do our press releases. Companies that care actually are buying carbon credits that count because that's what we have to do. We actually have to count. And community-based carbon credits are, are few and far to find. And I'm hoping that my business model allows more, um, more innovation to come out of labs and into homes. Thank you for all you do, Sarah. That's a fascinating story and uh, very interesting model that you uh, are deploying. Um, so if you have a question for Sarah, please enter it in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, in the meantime, I have a question. Um, and I was actually surprised. I, I did a little digging about uh, clean cook stoves and the impact on GHG uh, emissions worldwide. And I was surprised to see that uh, traditional cooking practices account for 2 to 5% of annual GHG emissions worldwide. Um, yeah. And uh, so what you're doing has a potential significant impact on reducing those emissions. Um, can you tell us on, on an average basis, you mentioned an audit of, of all of your systems uh, or all of your bags uh, uh, you know, that have been deployed. Uh, what is the kind of average um, GHG emissions per bag? Um, you know, so it's the average depending on the fuel source. And sorry, I was so intrigued by everybody that I've run out of battery. So I've had to come and sit on the floor with my battery. I'm sorry. Um, I'm definitely not polished like anybody here. Um, a bag saves one ton of carbon per annum. And that depends on the fuel source. So when it's wood, it can go up to three to four. Obviously, electricity is different. Um, depends what the, the source of electricity is. Um, but we, we, we quote, um, the average is one ton per bag per year. The life of a bag is 15 years. And our project, projects run for seven years and seven years renewable. So these bags can be reused. We have bags in homes that are 14 years old. They can be reused, rewashed, all of that. So it is an amazing, um, you know, model. How many bags have you you uh, distributed um, globally? Uh, what time two period? And a half. Two and a half million. Wow. Um, what what do you see as the the obstacles to even wider adoption? That's that's big number already but what do you what do you see as your obstacles and what you're facing scaling that's a very, Tim I must tell you that's a very small number for me I mean our our um 
our goal is to have a wonder bag in every home. But we were, when the carbon markets collapsed, I had to reinvent myself and become a retail business. So we were selling um, the bags to subsidize them in Africa. And, um, but now that the carbon markets are robust, our biggest, um, our biggest challenge is finance. And now that we are um, really seeing the impact and the growth of the voluntary carbon market and a huge turn in events, uh, that is going to drive our um, scaling. And we are scaling up to 100 million, I mean, 100,000 bags a month just in our South African facilities. So we are, we are on a big trajectory. And Tim, you talk about um, finding the right leadership teams for, um, for companies driving change. And that's been one of our biggest challenges to find people to to set the course on something that's quite different and it's very hands on the ground you know it's about manufacturing it's about distribution it's about activation it's about education so you know it's a it's a multi-dimensional business that requires multi-dimensional teams you mentioned facilities in south africa where are, what other facilities do you have and where are they and um, we have in Kampala in Uganda, and um, we had in Ghana. We are we restarting because of the pandemic. Um, we actually have a partnership with the International Federation of the Red Cross, and we utilize their infrastructures because they have the best infrastructures right in the communities. So these public-private partnerships are really what drive um, the, the scale-up and allow us to scale up in the way that we can. Um, we have a question from the audience. Have you partnered or worked with Air Terra in Africa? Air Terra. How, how does that spell? The, as in A-I-R and then Terra, T-E. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know how it's spelled, so I wouldn't have partnered with them. Okay. Um, no, I haven't. You know, um, we have some extraordinary partnerships and I believe in partnerships because I believe that the more people that do this, the more chance we've got of ad uh, adoption across the globe. And um, we will be saving millions, billions, 15 billion trees a year. So I welcome partnerships. Um, my website is www.wonderbagworld.com. You can also find me on LinkedIn, um, but there are contact details on the website. You can also follow us on um, yeah, Wonderbag on LinkedIn. Are, are you looking um, for investment or, I mean, I, I forget, how, how are you structured? I mean, are you structured as a, a nonprofit or are you structured as a for-profit entity? No, we were for-profit. We based out of London. Um, and our carbon projects are registered in London, but are activated in countries in Africa. And um, so we, we do pre-financing deals on carbon. We are looking for large scale funding and um, institutional funding. We also, it's 100% owned by me. So I'm also looking at this stage at, um, at possible equity investment. Um, you know, for the last 14 years, it has been a tech startup. And we're now going through, somebody mentioned, you know, that valley when you're coming out, that tough valley and you've got to change things. So taking on more investment, um, we are, you know, really scaling our, our teams. Um, we have commercial partners. And I think that maybe Peter's picture coming on means that I've done my time. So thank you very much, Peter. And thank you, Tim, and thank you.